Okay. Uh, good morning, everybody, and welcome to uh, this workshop of uh, the second workshop of C3.AI Digital Transformation Institute. Uh, before I turn it over to the co organizers, let me just tell you a little bit about uh, the Digital Transformation Institute. It's an institute that's uh, relatively new, just uh, put together in the end of March this year. And its mission is to unite the world's leading scientists in thinking about how AI, machine learning, IoT, and uh, certainly data analytics is transforming business, government, and society. Initially, it's uh, funded by C3.ai and Microsoft and has uh, as university partners, as co-leads the University of Illinois and uh, Berkeley, uh, along with MIT, Princeton, uh, uh, Princeton, Stanford, uh, University of Chicago, and Carnegie Mellon, and two national labs, the NCSA, the National Center for Super, uh, Supercomputing Applications, and Lawrence Berkeley Labs. Uh, of course, we reached beyond these universities, and we actually had, uh, uh, in the first set of projects, we have partnerships with uh, Hopkins, Penn, uh, Cornell, many other schools beyond this list, but these are the core members. Uh, it's uh, the, the workshop this week is especially wonderful. It's on the analytical foundations of deep learning, interpretability and performance guarantees. So uh, I'll let the organizers tell you, but they've got a wonderful program Monday through Wednesday and also on Friday. Uh, the two organizers, and I just want to spend a uh, uh, who are uh, my colleague E. Ma at Berkeley and Rene Vidal at Johns Hopkins University. And they have uh, really put together, I should say, an all-star cast, which is going to lead us through just a fantastic voyage about, uh, you know, how to really analyze uh, deep learning. You know, we've seen deep learning in action but quite often it's presented as being too hard to analyze and too hard to understand. But the speakers you see, you know, Peter Bartlett, Tom Goldstein, Gita Kutunyak, uh, Ribeiro, Alejandro Ribeiro, Guillermo Shapiro, Soledad Villa, uh, uh, Max Welling and Ben Yu will, you know, will really show you how much has been done in recent times to put this together. And so you're in for a treat. Thank you very much, uh, Shankar. So uh, on behalf of uh, Professor Yi Ma at UC Berkeley and myself, I am uh, delighted to welcome you to uh, this workshop on the analytical foundations of uh, deep learning. Uh, I wanted to begin by uh, uh, saying thank you to Srikant and Shankar and more broadly to the C3 uh, AI uh, Digital Transformation Institute for hosting uh, this workshop. Um, uh, continuing on uh, what Shankar was saying about the schedule, um, we will be meeting uh, every day from 9 a.m. to 2 p.m. Pacific time. Um, the way the workshop is organized is that today, Monday, will be primarily focused on tutorials. Tuesday and Wednesday uh, will be focused on more uh, detailed talks. Uh, in particular, this workshop uh, will focus on uh, four areas uh, of uh, the foundations of deep learning, uh, such as the principal design of architectures, the interpretability properties of deep network, robustness properties, as well as fairness. Uh, and on Friday, we will have detailed brainstorming sessions uh, about uh, these topics, trying to uh, discuss what are the key open challenges moving forward. Uh, Today, uh, we'll have uh, primarily two tutorials. Uh, the first one will be given by myself and it will cover primarily the foundations of feed forward networks. And the second one will be given by Professor Alejandro Ribeiro from UPenn uh, and he will cover the foundations of graph neural networks. Uh, but before that, uh, we thought uh, we would put together a little bit of an introduction to the overall workshop uh, to discuss, I think, why we believe it's important and uh, what are the key 
underpinnings that will be necessary for uh, working together for the entire week. So let me begin with that. So as you know, deep learning, uh, even though many of our young students think that it just began in 2012, uh, it actually has a very, very long history. The first neural networks appeared in the 1940s. At the time, uh, they were primarily uh, single neurons uh, and uh, they were binary. Uh, and the, they were called threshold logic units. And, and the, then the, maybe the very first one that was a little bit more well-known, even uh, we use it today, is the perception in 1957. Even the first algorithm for training these simple networks uh, were proposed. It was called Adaline, uh, and it was proposed in the 1960s. Uh, but as I have uh, highlighted here, uh, one important aspect of the history of neural networks is that there's been uh, periods of hype followed by uh, the so-called neural winters. And uh, what I find interesting is that uh, there were many reasons for these neural winters, but one of them was uh, and has always been lack of theoretical foundations. The first uh, neural winter in particular uh, was partly due to uh, a paper by Minsky and Papert, where uh, they showed that uh, these simple uh, binary neural networks approximate the XOR function that was at the time sort of the basic part of any logic circuit. And so that led to a good 10 years uh, of lack of research in this area. In the late 70s, uh, 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 many things happened. In particular, uh, networks became uh, deeper with multiple layers, continuous valued, uh, convolutional neural networks were invented and that led to the first applications in computer vision, particularly the recognition of digits. Uh, later on, uh, uh, recurrent networks were also invented uh, and in particular LSTMs uh, that then led to the uh, great advances in speech. Uh, and well, obviously, uh, the ability to train these networks on data was a significant uh, aspect of this success. And uh, the main algorithm for doing that uh, was the uh, so-called backpropagation, which is essentially a combination of the chain rule with gradient descent. But again, uh, towards the end of the uh, millennium, uh, maybe uh, neural networks were not working on more advanced data sets they became a black box, difficult to explain and understand what they do. And the alternative uh, was the use of simpler classifiers like linear classifiers or support vector machines uh, for which you would have a good understanding of the properties. Uh, you could train an SVM by solving a convex problem. You would have guarantees of their generalization properties and uh, neural networks uh, were black boxes. And so for a good 10 years, uh, and this is the case, for example, in computer vision, much of the research in object recognition was, let me come up with great features that I can extract from images and fit them to a classifier, such as a linear classifier or a support vector machine. And it was not only up until uh, 2012 that deep networks really began uh, to work and being used. And I think many of you know the great successes. So here's the success of deep learning in computer vision, particularly in image classification, where uh, pre-deep learning methods uh, had an error of the order of 30% uh, in 2010, 2011. And in just two or three years, that error was driven uh, by one order of magnitude to under 3% uh, using uh, deep networks. The same uh, has happened in speech recognition. So this is a plot of the accuracy uh, and um, it, sorry, uh, this is a plot of the error in this case. And uh, the error was uh, quite high, quite flat for a good 10 years. And again, through the use of deep network technology, uh, today we have uh, devices such as Siri or Alexa in our homes. Uh, this has also been extended to uh, 
uh, decision making, uh, sequential decision making, particularly the use of games. Uh, so uh, it also made it to the news that uh, a deep network, uh, AlphaGo, was able to beat the world champion at playing Go. And this has been extended uh, through deep reinforcement learning technique to many other uh, application areas, uh, particularly other games. But getting that to work maybe in, in real dynamical systems is still uh, just at the beginning. So because the focus of this workshop is really on understanding the foundations, uh, what we are worried here is the question of why. Why is it the case that these uh, incredibly large uh, networks are performing so well? And when we were asking these questions early on, uh, say around 2012, 13, 14 or so, uh, there was a lot of uh, beliefs as to why this would be the case. So one uh, of such beliefs is that these networks have the ability to learn features, and these features are useful for a specific task. This is as opposed to uh, what was done before, where you would handcraft uh, the features and then feed them to a linear classifier. Now, uh, I would maybe partially disagree with this. Uh, I would say that it's true. Features are learned now for a specific task, and therefore they're better suited for that task in particular. But what has been happening is that we have replaced the handcrafting of features by the handcrafting of architectures. And for every new application, you have to come up with modifications. And those modifications are usually driven by uh, practical performance. But we do not have a principal framework yet for the design of architectures. And so that motivates one of the key aspects of this workshop. A, another reason uh, is that, at least empirically, and it has been shown that the more layers, the better. Uh, and when trying to explain that phenomena at the very beginning, uh, the key explanation was that more layers are able to capture more invariances. Uh, and this is particularly relevant in applications in computer vision and speech where uh, you would like to do classification despite a variety of nuisance factors that might affect the data. In computer vision, for example, uh, you want to classify a dog or a cat regardless of viewpoint or lighting conditions. And therefore, you want to ensure that your predictions are invariant to those changes that affect the data but don't affect what you're trying to predict. And so uh, this is a paper from 2014 that did experiments uh, where the x-axis is the number of layers, the y-axis is the mean average precision in a classification task. And empirically, it was shown that uh, the larger the network, the better the performance. And uh, we're going to see uh, in many of the talks this week that we have much better explanations today for this phenomena. And this is today known as overparameterization, where you just make the networks bigger and bigger and the performance improves. And understanding why is one of the key challenges of the studies of the foundations of deep networks today. But really, uh, if you ask the question, uh, was there any change in the deep networks of 2012 relative to the 80s? Um, what was different? And if you look at them, the differences were very minor. Uh, yes, the networks were bigger, but at the end of the day, the primary reason uh, or the primary change from the 2012 to uh, 1980s is that there was a lot more data to train these networks. And that allowed one uh, to train them uh, and, and, and the, the access to GPUs enabled uh, one to train them quickly. And in terms of changes, uh, they were very minor. Uh, so one of them uh, is slightly different ways of regularizing uh, during training. In particular, the traditional way was always weight decay or L2 square regularization. And instead, some new techniques emerged uh, that were stochastic, like dropout, where during training, you only update a fraction of the weights and you set the activations to zero otherwise. Another change uh, was the use of slightly different nonlinearities that uh, had been used in the 80s. So in particular, uh, it was common to use these sigmoidal functions, what I'm showing here in blue, 
uh, but now it has become popular to use these rectified linear units that are essentially zero or linear. And when you ask the practitioners why this would be the case, a common explanation that is given is the so-called vanishing gradient problem. That if you look at a sigmoid, then the gradient is zero uh, before the activation. The gradient is nearly zero uh, once it's activated. And only there is a small region where the gradient is non-zero. So uh, they tend to conjecture that this means that uh, the training algorithms would get stuck because the gradient is, is zero. In contrast, uh, they argue uh, the gradient is zero for a ReLU in this region, but then it's the identity. So you don't have this problem of vanishing gradient. Uh, so that is an intuitive explanation uh, and, and anybody maybe part of why this is the case, but uh, from a pure optimization perspective, that answer is not satisfactory uh, because the fact that uh, the gradient doesn't vanish doesn't tell you anything about the landscape of the objective or why you would converge to a global mean. So I'd like to uh, argue that our theoretical understanding of uh, deep networks remain shallow. And I think it's great that over the last three or four years, this area of understanding the foundations of learning has really exploited. And now we've got many people working in various areas of uh, deep networks. So what are the key theoretical areas uh, of research within the foundations of deep learning? The first one is how do we design architectures? I already alluded to that in a, a few minutes ago. The second one is how do we deal with the fact that uh, we are solving very large scale optimization problems that are convex and how do we have guarantees of optimality? And the last one is uh, the question of generalization, which is maybe the most important from a machine learning perspective. Why is it the case that networks train on a small amount of data work so well uh, on new data and maybe even in slightly different problem domains that they were trained for. So these questions uh, are not new uh, and they've been studied for a very long time. The question of architecture design, which uh, is essentially how many layers, what is the size, uh, what types of nonlinearities do I put, how do I connect different pieces of the architecture? has been studied uh, for a long time. And the first studies were all from an approximation theoretic perspective, rather than from a learning perspective. The goal there was, well, what classes of functions can I approximate uh, with a neural network? And the results from the 80s uh, have already shown that uh, neural networks with a single hidden layer are universal approximators for continuous functions. Just to actually uh, even write down uh, quickly this result, this is uh, cut and paste from uh, the paper uh, from Sibenko in 89. Essentially, the idea is that uh, you have a function. Uh, the function is a continuous function. Uh, this is the uh, little f here. And then you construct a neural network, capital F, uh, and that neural network here, uh, wi, are the weights of the ith neuron for the input. X is the input data. Bi here is the bias. Rho is some uh, nonlinearity. And Vi is the weight for the output. And capital N here uh, is the total number of neurons. And so as it turns out, uh, you give me any epsilon, and you can always find a neural network capital F that can approximate any given function little f that is continuous within epsilon. And so uh, that's exactly what universal approximation means, that uh, you can always construct a neural network with a single hidden layer that would approximate uh, a given continuous function. So that might immediately raise the question as to why do we need deep networks then, if even shallow networks uh, already have universal approximation capabilities? And the answer is that these theorems uh, don't tell you how many neurons you need, right? And so it could be the case that for a given epsilon, the number of neurons n is uh, exponentially large. 
And that has motivated a lot of the research over the last five or six years in the area of approximation theory for neural networks. And the first uh, papers uh, in this uh, area began by really demonstrating that there are some gaps uh, between deep and shallow networks. Um, and a series of results studied the approximation uh, capabilities uh, and, and many of them uh, come from both approximation theory and harmonic analysis. Uh, Gita Coutinhoc, who is one of our speakers uh, in this workshop, uh, has done uh, great work in this area recently. So this is the, the last paper pointed out here. Let me now move to the second question, optimization. Uh, the challenges are uh, manifold. One of them is the large number of variables. Uh, one is solving here optimization problems, say over 60 million variables. But another one is that the problem is generally non-convex. And so you might be interested in knowing what does the error surface look like? Uh, does it have many uh, local minima, subtle points? Is it easy to get stuck? Uh, and then how do I design algorithms? And one of the big mysteries uh, is and remains that uh, very simple techniques uh, such as gradient descent or stochastic gradient descent appear to routinely find uh, good global minima uh, for these problems. So why is it the case that even though the landscape could be incredibly complex, uh, simple algorithms seem to succeed very often? So again, uh, this question was uh, heavily studied in the 80s and one of the uh, well-known results is this result that there is no spurious local minima when the network is linear. Uh, by linear network, we mean a network that has no nonlinearities, that the, the activation maps are the identity matrix. And this was done again for networks with a single hidden layer uh, in 1989. Uh, and the, what happened was that all other results in optimization were negative. This may be the only positive result. And so there were many results in the 80s and 90s that backpropagation would fail to converge as soon as you had nonlinearity, that in order for it to converge, you need to make really strong assumptions on the data, like it being linearly separable, or otherwise it would easily get stuck. And when you add multiple layers, there was this paper in uh, 2000, showing that there'll be many local minima and plateaus uh, once you have multiple layers. And this may have been one of the reasons why people uh, stopped looking at uh, neural networks at the time and went to study super vector machines instead because it was just too complex at the time. So uh, this has motivated a lot of research. Uh, one of uh, my first uh, favorite papers in this area is from Benjo in 2005, uh, where I think it points out to one of the trends today, which is that by making networks bigger, the optimization problem becomes easier. And so uh, this paper from 2005 was one of the first ones to show that if you take a network with a single hidden layer, and you over parameterize, you net the number of neurons goes to infinity, then you get a convex optimization problem. And uh, there was over there already L1 regularization to show that even though you have an infinite number of uh, hidden neurons, only finitely many of them uh, get to be used if you use proper regularization. The second and third papers over there are in various ways extensions of the, at least of the ideas, the, the, the intuition of the Baldi and Horning paper in 1989. So uh, the Baldi and Horning paper was extended from uh, networks with two layers to deep linear networks, uh, also with the square loss. And that was a result due to Kawayuchi in 2016. But it has also been extended now to uh, networks with nonlinearities, particularly positively homogeneous networks. Uh, and by and large, actually, the first part of the tutorial that I'll be giving today will focus on these uh, three papers by Baldi and Hornick, Kawayachi, and A. Philip. But beyond that, uh, there's been a lot of studies of the landscape, uh, particularly understanding the role of level sets as well as uh, many papers that are trying to connect the landscape of deep networks with the landscape of problems in physics uh, using tools from uh, statistical physics. 
beyond just the landscape though, uh, there is a lot of interest on understanding optimization algorithms. Why is it the case that gradient descent uh, converges? And so uh, connections between uh, adding noise to the gradients or uh, stochastic optimization methods have been studied. Uh, the continuous limit of stochastic gradient descent uh, has been studied uh, that leads to solving some PDEs. Um, there is also studies about trying to accelerate uh, optimization algorithms. The fact that uh, over parameterization or making the networks bigger uh, might automatically or implicitly induce acceleration, um, as well as uh, the study of the uh, convergence of gradient descent in these over parameterized settings. Let me now move to the third uh, area which is generalization. Why is it the case that uh, neural networks generalize to other examples? So if we go back to uh, the results from the 80s and 90s, at least for linear classifiers, uh, many generalization bounds have been derived, namely what is the number of training examples that is needed uh, in order to have a guarantee that the generalization error is less than a given epsilon. And uh, by and large, rule of thumb, the number of training examples uh, needed is typically polynomial in the uh, number of parameters that you're trying to fit in the dimension of the group. And so in this particular case, if you have a network, it should be say, just for an example, quadratic on the number of weights. But obviously, if you apply that to deep networks, uh, something, uh, something is completely off because if you think about uh, the uh, AlexNet that has 60 million parameters, you would have had to have 60 million square training examples uh, for those classical generalization bounds for linear classifiers. And obviously uh, uh, ImageNet only had a million examples, not 60 million square. So a big mystery is why is it the case that uh, deep networks generalize well, even though they're being trained with a number of training examples that is dramatically smaller than what would have been predicted. Uh, what it, it's interesting is that some of the, uh, in, in classically, you would uh, ensure generalization by adding a regularizer to the loss, typically a square loss uh, or weight decay. But the techniques used for regularization now are uh, stopping the algorithm early uh, or uh, doing this random uh, update where uh, at every iteration only half of the weights are updated or uh, batch normalization, which is another uh, technique. And so why is it the case that these heuristics uh, actually work or really uh, improve generalization? And why is it the case that uh, networks generalize with a number of training examples that is uh, fairly small? So this motivated a series of papers around 2015 and 16, uh, really thinking about the fact that classical generalization theory maybe does not depend on uh, the data directly. And so trying to capture the role of the data, uh, maybe uh, trying to look at alternative measures beyond uh, L2 squared. And so this path SGD uh, type of uh, regularizers that uh, is really becoming uh, sort of products of norm type uh, regularization on the weights and obtaining generalization bounds. But despite those results, uh, the generalization bounds were still far from what you would observe in, in practice. A third approach has come from information theory, particularly information bottleneck, where the idea is that maybe the number of weights or immediate norms on the weights are not the right way to capture the capacity of a network. Uh, some examples that could be given, right? You could have a large network and then a single neuron and then a large uh, uh, network again. So are there ways in which we can measure this bottleneck uh, in order to have a way to regularize the networks based on information theoretic quantities? And then there was this uh, great paper uh, showing experiments that uh, networks can generalize even though you uh, can uh, randomly permute the labels. And so all of them together, uh, there's been the uh, thinking for the last several years that we really need to rethink the way we 
derived generalization bounds. And this has led to maybe the current trends. And the current trends, uh, and these are maybe the, the hottest topics in the foundations of deep learning today, is that the explanation as to why many of these heuristics actually work is because even though uh, you don't have enough training examples, even though uh, you don't use regularization in the classical way, the optimization algorithm is automatically inducing some form of regularization. And this has led to the study of the regularization properties of gradient descent, dropout, batch normalization. Beyond that, uh, there's been the discovery of the so-called neural tangent kernel regime, where uh, if you initialize uh, with small weights, the uh, dynamics of uh, gradient flow or the dynamics of gradient descent are such that the weights remain close to initialization. And this happens when the number of neurons in the hidden layer goes to infinity in which case the, the training pro, uh, problem really becomes linear and can be well approximated uh, via uh, the, 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 the neural tangent kernel. And uh, last but not least, uh, the, the role of overparametrization and the connections between overparametrization and the classical bias uh, variance dilemma. So what is shown here on the left uh, is really the classical paradigm where the y-axis is the risk and the x-axis is the complexity of the network. And during training, uh, that error uh, tends to go down. But during testing, it goes down and then it eventually goes up. And there is this magic uh, sweet spot here with the complexity. Uh, and that's where you get the best uh, test error. And so the idea now is that uh, we are letting the complexity of the network just grow uh, because the size of the network is significantly larger. And there is the possibility that, yes, the test risk goes down and then goes up, but then there is now this uh, second sweet spot that is now called the uh, interpolation threshold, uh, based uh, after which the training risk gets to zero. And then uh, in that so-called overparametrized regime, the uh, test risk is going down. So again, this is very interesting. This is now called the double descent risk curve. There's been many papers advocating now that you can have as many descents as, as you wish. And uh, we're going to have a talk uh, by Peter Bartlett where he's going to be talking about this phenomenon. So uh, what I wanted to finish uh, in this introduction is by saying that what makes uh, this area incredibly exciting is that uh, these three theoretical aspects, uh, even though they're in principle distinct, they're all interrelated. Um, and that's what makes uh, the problem incredibly challenging. Uh, in particular, uh, for example, in, in the past, at least for linear classification, you could, because the problem was convex, you could just design an optimization algorithm to find the global optimum and then analyze the generalization properties uh, sort of independently. The challenge is that because the optimization problem is non-convex, you can have many uh, global minimizers. And that is why optimization plays a role. Depending on how you initialize, depending on which optimization method you choose, depending on the parameters of that optimization algorithm, you might end up in a different uh, global minima. And different global minima may have different generalization properties. And so the, the mystery and the key theoretical question is, why is it the case that, say, gradient descent with these parameters or with this initialization always converges to solutions that generalize well? And that is sort of this key interplay between optimization and regularization. Of course, there is also an interplay between architecture and optimization. We will see that. And the current wisdom is that larger architectures are easier to optimize. Again, uh, establishing the connection between overparametrization, optimization, and regularization. And of course, the architecture um, is uh, related to regularization as well. Uh, even though we might be working with uh, overparametrized networks, we still might have the need to regularize at least uh, with some measure of size of that network. So how do we do that? Uh, we'll, we'll see that in a moment. 
Um, everything I've said so far is maybe the classical statistical learning view of uh, deep networks and why uh, in the, the key three theoretical areas to be studied. But as deep learning is beginning to have an impact in our daily lives, and these neural networks are actually beginning to be used in practice, there are new theoretical issues that are beginning to emerge. So uh, if neural networks are now going to be installed in a real world system, then uh, you need to communicate predictions of neural networks to decision makers. So how do you do so uh, when, uh, if neural networks are a black box? So there is a need to have a better understanding of when they work and when they fail. And uh, you need to have the ability to ensure the, their robustness. And so the robustness of these networks have become another very important area. Uh, you need to make sure that you're not overstating what can be inferred and ideally have um, confidence intervals around the predictions of deep networks. Uh, you would like to make sure that the predictions that neural networks are made are fair. Um, and maybe you want to be able to interpret those predictions. For example, in the case of applications in medicine, it's very important that uh, clinicians trust uh, AI. And so how do you, we do that? Uh, I'm going to contradict myself. Uh, I'm going to mention here a few uh, works in this area. The literature is, is really large. These, er these areas of fairness, accountability, and transparency are exploding. And I'm not being very fair to the large literature here. I'm mentioning only a few and it's particularly biased towards uh, some of the speakers that we're gonna have this week. So in the area of robustness, uh, Tom Goldstein will be speaking uh, about the area of robustness. Uh, Professor Yu will be speaking about veridical data science. Uh, we had invited uh, Emmanuel Candes, who's been doing great work in conformal inference, but he, he won't be able to make it. Uh, fairness, uh, Guillermo is going to be speaking about that. And uh, Gita Coutinho will be speaking about uh, uh, interpretability and a rate distortion framework for explaining the decisions made by neural networks. So uh, with that in mind, uh, let me uh, conclude then uh, by saying that, um, at least conclude this introduction that I think we are very excited to welcome you. And um, we will now continue with the beginning of the first tutorial uh, that will really focus on some of the details uh, on the foundations of deep power networks. All right, so, uh, let me begin just with a little bit of notation. Uh, generally speaking, I'm going to denote the input to the neural network as X uh, and the weights as W. Uh, this is the simplest possible architecture with a single uh, neural network where you just take the dot product between the weights and the input, uh, and then you pass them through a nonlinearity. As I mentioned earlier, typical forms of nonlinearity are this sigmoidal function uh, highlighted in blue and the rectify linear unit uh, function highlighted in red. In the case of multi-layer networks, uh, again, the notation is gonna be that the input is going to be X and the output is going to be Y. The weights are going to be denoted by uh, W, generally speaking, and the supra index will denote which layer we're in. In this case, it's capital L layers. And the number of inputs will be denoted by N0. N1 will be the number of hidden neurons in the first hidden layer, all the way through NL, which will denote the uh, total number of outputs. So the mapping from the input X to the output Y for a fit forward network is a series of alternating linear transformations followed by a nonlinearity. And so here it is. So we begin uh, with the input X. Uh, we do a linear transformation with uh, parameters W1, then a nonlinearity Psi1, and then we repeat the process L times. And so this notation capital Phi is going to denote the output of the network that depends on the input X and it depends on all of the weights, uh, right? And what we want to do is to compare the output that the network predicts with the uh, ground truth uh, labels for Y. 
I'm going to use the same notation, uh, not just for a single input data point, but uh, whenever we are talking about the training set, we need to apply this map to every training example. And therefore, in that case, I'm going to use a matrix capital X and uh, the corresponding capital Y here. So uh, let me now begin with a single uh, slide on the basics of statistical learning and where the, does this decomposition of our architecture, optimization, and generalization comes from. So suppose that uh, you have to train a, a network to make a prediction from an image. And uh, let me denote by H the set of all possible prediction functions that can map the input space X to the output space Y. So in reality, uh, we are not going to be searching uh, by uh, actually, and let me say that f sub h denotes the ground truth. That's the ideal function that predicts uh, y from x. In reality, we are not going to be searching over all possible prediction functions. We are going to restrict ourselves to a smaller class called the space of hypotheses, say the space of linear classifiers or the space of neural networks with a single hidden layer or uh, the space of P4 networks. And so whatever we do, whatever we estimate is not going to be in the, uh, the space of all prediction functions, but it has to belong to this space of hypothesis. And already that means that I'm potentially going to have some error uh, between whatever I'm able to predict inside the space of hypothesis versus the truth. And that is what we call the approximation error. And that is the area of approximation theory that tries to say what classes of functions can a neural network approximate. That's exactly this uh, first error. Now, um, this uh, optimal hypothesis, though, is optimal assuming that I could uh, optimize with respect to all possible inputs and outputs according to the sort of population distribution of inputs and outputs. In reality, uh, what we always do is that we try to find the optimal hypothesis given a training set. And so uh, what we're going to do is we're going to find some other uh, hypothesis that we obtain by empirical risk minimization. And that hypothesis uh, is, might be different from the optimal hypothesis. And that's uh, what we're going to call generalization error. The question is, what is the risk uh, that uh, this empirical hypothesis makes relative risk in the population. And we would like those to be as possible in order for a machine to generalize well. And last but not least, uh, the issue is that uh, we always have an optimization algorithm uh, that we use to minimize the risk. And uh, if the problem was convex and I could solve the problem with infinite precision, then I would get uh, these empirically optimal hypothesis. But in reality, I'm going to stop after a finite number of iterations, and the problem could be non-convex, so I might be stuck in a local minima. So that is where uh, I incur an optimization error. So uh, more formally, uh, the typical training problem of a neural network is going to be stated in the following way. Uh, I'm going to have my prediction function that depends on the input training data X and the weights of the network W. I compare that with the labels uh, Y according to some laws. And generally speaking, we're going to use some form of regularization on the weights. And so uh, the architecture uh, is designed to control the approximation error. So the larger the architecture, uh, the smaller the approximation. The regularization function is designed to uh, control the generalization error. Um, and the optimizer is designed to control the optimization error. And that's exactly why these are the three key areas on the foundations of deep learning. Um, <clears throat> so in this uh, tutorial on the foundations of feed forward networks, uh, the first part, which I'll be doing now in the next uh, 25 minutes or so, uh, we'll focus on understanding the optimization landscape for linear networks. And by and large, the key results that I'll be showing is that in the case where the nonlinear activations are actually linear, you can show results such as that all local minima are global, that other critical points are subtle points, uh, that subtle points are strict, uh, 
And this is important to, to guarantee that you can avoid saddles uh, and you can have guarantees for optimization algorithms. And this is the case for networks with a single hidden layer. But when you have deep networks, you may have uh, some subtle points that are not strict. And that's going to be primarily the, the first part. Then uh, Alejandro is going to talk about uh, graph neural networks. And after that, I'll come with the second part. So the second part will uh, uh, analyze the landscape of a certain class of uh, nonlinear deep networks called positively homogeneous uh, neural networks that have uh, positively homogeneous activation functions and regularization functions. So in this case, we're going to show that if the network is sufficiently wide, all local minima are global, uh, and that it is possible to scape uh, local minima by increasing the size of the network. If there is time, uh, I'll also uh, talk a little bit about optimization methods, particularly dropout, and try to explain what it does, uh, show that it's a stochastic gradient descent method, and that it induces implicit regularization on the weights in the form of low rank weights and balanced solutions. Now to provide a little bit more detail at a high level of the key areas of this tutorial, uh, as I said, in the case of linear networks, basically this is the picture that I'll be trying to argue that there is a unique up to change of basis, uh, global minimum and all other critical points are really subtle points. For the case of homogeneous networks, uh, the, uh, the landscape is going to become benign under the assumptions that uh, the activation functions are positively homogeneous and the regularizer is positively homogeneous. Uh, we're going to require networks to have parallel structure and regularization that is added to the data. Specifically, uh, one of the key results that I'll be showing in, in the tutorial is this idea that if you have networks with many parallel subnetworks and you have a local minimum such that the weights of one of the parallel sub networks is zero. That is a certificate to guarantee the global optimality uh, for that sub network. And the second uh, main result of the second part of the tutorial will be that uh, even though in principle you have this non convex landscape, uh, when the size of the network, when the width is sufficiently large, local minima, such as the one that I'm illustrating here, where you need to uh, increase the value of the objective in order to escape, are guaranteed not to exist. So the landscape is more uh, as shown in the far right, where there are many global minimizers, but there is no local minimum. Again, under the assumption that uh, the size of the network is sufficiently big. And uh, the, the questions about dropout, I think the, the key results are, that dropout is a stochastic gradient descent method uh, for minimizing a certain stochastic objective. The stochastic objective is uh, induces explicit regularization. In fact, is low rank regularization. And even more, it's nuclear norm squared style regularization. And uh, when characterizing the implicit bias of dropout, uh, there is a notion of balance weights that arises. And if there is time, I'll, I'll get to discuss that. So let me begin now with the optimization landscape for linear networks. So I'll begin with the simplest possible case where we have a linear network with a single hidden layer. So in this case, as I said before, X will denote the input, Y will denote the output. And I'm going to change the notation about the weights. Uh, rather than using W, I'm going to use V for the input weights and U for the output weights. And the reason for that, you will see it in a moment, is just to be, uh, become well connected with matrix factorization where we'll get UV transfers everywhere. And as I said before, the number of inputs is N0, the dimension of the hidden layer N1, and the dimension of the output layer will be N2. So in this particular case, the hypothesis space, uh, and that is highlighted uh, here, uh, and that's, that's exactly what I was trying to say, that the input output map simply is obtained by taking the input x, 
we're going to multiply by the matrix of input weights and by the matrix of output weights. And I apologize for putting V transpose uh, as the weight, it's weird. Uh, but as you can see now, it, it connects very well with classical uh, matrix factorization style literature. <clears throat> All right, so in this particular case, uh, what is the risk? Uh, we're going to consider the square loss. So in the case of the square loss, uh, we obtain uh, what is shown uh, over there, where we have here uh, UV transpose X, the error with respect to Y is squared. And we take the expected value with respect to uh, the distribution of both X and Y, which are the input and output data. And the optimization problem is to minimize this risk as a function of the network weights, which in this case is U and V. So uh, the empirical risk uh, is uh, shown here. Uh, so in this particular case, rather than taking the expected value with respect to the distribution, we just take the sum of the squares of the errors. And what I want to point out immediately here is that uh, when written in matrix notation is getting close and close to um, a matrix factorization uh, problem. In particular, if you look here, uh, this is almost like, uh, factorizing the matrix of labels Y as the product of U and V. The only difference is that we've got this matrix of inputs uh, right here. So uh, one important observation is that the risk can be expanded and written in the following form. And the reason I'm writing it this way is because uh, it will allow us to see actually that both the the population risk as well as the empirical risk have the same identical form and therefore they can be treated together. Uh, so in particular, uh, what I want to say is that uh, this sigma x here, which is the covariance between x and x, here this is the covariance between y and x, and here's the covariance between y and y, in the empirical case, this is just replaced by um, x transpose x divided by the number of training examples. And therefore, uh, the risk at the end of the day has identically the same form in this particular case for the uh, expected risk versus the empirical risk. So with that in mind, uh, I also want to point out the connection with matrix factorization almost directly. If that covariance matrix of the input data is invertible, then uh, we can rewrite the optimization problem. Uh, it's a change of variables for V. So in particular, uh, what you can just do here is uh, that you merge, uh, sorry, you merge the, uh, the V and transpose an X into a new V tilde. And you get the optimization problems here. So what I want to point out is that you can always think about the uh, risk minimization problem as, uh, tra as just doing a matrix factorization problem where you are given this sigma y x, sigma x x inverse, and you try to factorize it as the product of U and V. Or similarly, uh, you are just given this whitened form of the labels, whitened by the inverse of the input, and you're trying to factorize that as the product of U and V. So in other words, this sort of shows that uh, at least in some cases, uh, the training of uh, a neural network is equivalent to factorizing matrices. So let me now move to um, uh, the main results that I want to show here. So uh, as I said, the key results that we're gonna show is that the landscape is such that there is a single global minimum and that all other saddle points are, uh, uh, all other critical points are saddle points. Specifically, I already showed this, this is the risk. And here's the, the first important observation. So suppose that I were to substitute uh, UV transpose by another variable Z. Then I just get a quadratic problem uh, that is actually convex, and I can actually solve that in closed form. Obviously, uh, in order for that to be the case, the z variable will need to be free, 
And so all I need is that the U and V are full rank. Uh, so in other words, there is sufficiently many neurons in that hidden layer so that the Z variable is really free. But the interesting thing is that if uh, in the original objective, I just forget about the weights and I substitute UV transpose by Z, then I just have a linearly squares problem. And in fact, this, uh, there is a closed form solution for it, uh, which is written here. So what is very interesting is that uh, in that case, you know, the fact that I have a neural network when the number of hidden units is sufficiently large is pretty much irrelevant. We could just compute directly the input output map in closed form uh, from the covariance matrices of Y and X. And in the empirical case, again, this would just be replaced by Y X transpose uh, and similar here, X X transpose inverse. So this motivates immediately the, the suggestion that uh, the overparametrized regime is, is easy uh, and that really the landscape is only becomes a little bit more involved and you need to think about what, what's happening when the number of hidden neurons is small relative to the number of inputs and output neurons. And that was exactly the question that was addressed by this paper, 1989, by Baldi and Hornick. And this uh, is the theorem from that paper. It says that if the covariance matrix of the input is invariable, uh, as motivated already by uh, the, the simple observation that I've made before, and if this matrix sigma uh, that is obtained from the covariance matrices of the inputs and outputs is also invertible, the dimension of this sigma is the number of outputs, okay? Then the global minima can be obtained in closed form. Uh, what is the closed form? Well, the U factor is just going to be this Q matrix. And what is this Q matrix? This is the top N1 eigenvectors of that sigma matrix. Again, I'm trying to violate this, the overparametrized regime. So I'm assuming that N1 is smaller than the dimension of the output and is smaller than the dimension of the input. So all I need to do here, the U solution is going to be exactly the top N1 eigenvectors of that uh, sigma matrix. The matrix V is going to be exactly what you would have obtained uh, in the overparametrized uh, regime, but multiplied on the right by the same uh, Q matrix. And in fact, the global optimum product UV transpose or the global optimum input output map for the network is going to be exactly what you would have obtained in the overparametrized regime, which is here on the far right, but just projected according to this eigenvector. So is the global optimum in the overparametrized regime times Q transpose and times Q on the left. Uh, and this characterization is, uh, is, up, is this an equivalence class, by the way? This is up to a change of basis because you can always inject an invertible matrix between U and V. Uh, but other than that, this provides a complete characterization for <clears throat> the uh, set of global minimizers of the risk function. And again, the important observation is that it really just comes from matrix linear algebra uh, from the eigenvectors of the, uh, this covariance matrix. Now, the paper uh, from Baldi and Hornick actually went a little bit more. It not only characterized the, the global minimum, but it actually characterized all of the critical points of the risk function. And in particular, uh, if instead of choosing just the top so many eigenvectors of the sigma matrix, choose any, any N1, uh, they're sorted here from, from the largest to the smallest. And so that Q sub J is any selection of N1 eigenvectors. Then this provides a characterization of all critical points and all critical points are of identically the same form. The U matrix is always the matrix of eigenvectors and the V matrix is always the same as uh, the overparametrized solution multiplied by the matrix of eigenvectors. And therefore, all what's going on is that different choices of N1 eigenvectors produce different uh, critical points. And so the second uh, bullet point here uh, says that for all choices of J that are not the top N1 of them, so all choices of eigenvectors, 
all of those critical points are always strict saddle points. And therefore the only critical point that is a global minima is when you choose the top so many eigenvectors. So you might be very familiar maybe with the simplest problem uh, that you might know that has this property and that is just computation of eigenvectors and eigenvalues where you always know there is one global minimum and all other eigenvalues are typically saddle points. And then there is a global maximum for the largest eigenvalue. So the key distinction here really is that there is a global minimum and then all other points are saddles and there is no maximum. But it's very much similar to, to that intuition that you might be aware of. Now, notice that there is this assumption that the U needs to be full column rank in order for this to be the case. So the third bullet point here says that if U is rank deficient, then, uh, then any critical point is a strict cell. Okay. So to summarize, uh, what was important, and this is already a result from uh, 1989, is that a complete characterization of uh, critical points and global minima was already done in the 80s for this problem. And that the key assumptions uh, for the theorems pertain, uh, some matrices need to be full rank, particularly the covariance matrices. But there is also the fact that the critical points have to be uh, full rank. And if they're rank deficient, then uh, you, you, you just get a strict side. So recent work, and this is work now from 2018 and 2019, has sort of completed uh, the results from this old uh, Baldi and Hornig paper. Uh, showing that many of the assumptions uh, were actually not needed and that the landscape is benign even when those assumptions are violated. In particular, <clears throat> uh, this result says that any uh, local minimum of the risk is a global minimum, okay? And this doesn't require the invertibility of sigma xx or the invertibility of sigma anymore. So any local minimum uh, is a global minimum. The second one is that if sigma xx is invertible, uh, then the critical points that are not a global minimum are strict cells. So uh, this is, in a sense, uh, a summary that even without the assumptions of full ruggedness, uh, the, the landscape is relatively benign. And uh, there is a single, uh, sorry, there is a single global minimum up to a change of basis and all other points are uh, strict saddles. And therefore, uh, that this will dramatically facilitate the, uh, the fact that one can show that algorithms converge to global. So let me now move <clears throat> to the case of deep uh, linear networks. So the notation is pretty much the same. X is the input, Y is the output. I'm gonna go back now to the Ws for denoting, uh, denoting the, the weights. Uh, so W1 through WL. And again, uh, N0 through NL are going to be the number of neurons in each one of the uh, layers. The hypothesis space, the input-output map, uh, is going to be uh, the same as before. So we begin with X. We multiply by W1, W2, W3, all the way to WL, and we obtain the output F of X. And so uh, this is exactly what we've got here. That's going to be my input output map. Notice again, the input output map is still linear. It's just that the linear map is now the product of many linear transformations. And again, each linear transformation uh, has dimensions NL times NL minus one. Okay, so the risk uh, is the same as before, um, is the expected value with respect to all input output x and y of the squared loss. And what I want to point out is that even though we've got this long chain of multiplications and now a deep network with L layers, we can still write the risk in exactly the same way as we did it for the case of two layers. Uh, and as before, it really depends on a single matrix. And this is kind of obvious now in the aftermath which is just the product of all the matrices. So again, the same observation that I made in the case of two layers, if that matrix is unconstrained, which will happen when the individual weight matrices are sufficiently large, if the number of hidden neurons 
for every hidden layer is larger than the number of inputs and the number of outputs, then that W, that product matrix will be unconstrained. And therefore, the same uh, result on, of the overparametrized case, if you wish, holds true that I can just compute this product of matrices in closed form from the covariance matrices of the inputs and the outputs. And so you might wonder, well, why do I need to train a deep network? I could just solve it in closed form. Again, it only becomes relevant for this case of linear networks when the dimensions of the hidden layers are smaller. Okay. And so that was exactly the, uh, the case that Kawaguchi studied in 2016. What is the landscape uh, of these square laws in the case of a deep linear network? And so here is the result. Again, uh, the same uh, style of results as for the, the case of a single hidden layer. You need sigma x, x to be full rank. But there is a new uh, assumption being made here that didn't appear before. And that new assumption is that now we require this sigma x, y to be full rank as well. And that's a, <clears throat> a little bit of a strong assumption because it will require that the number of outputs needs to be less than the number of inputs. Uh, so maybe that's not such a strong requirement in the sense that if you think about um, uh, the case of images and zero is going to be the number of pixels and L is the number of classes. So, so maybe this is not such a big deal, but this is extra. So we need sigma XX, sigma XY to be full rank and the same matrix as before to be full rank. So this is kind of imposing all of the constraints as in the Baldi and Hornick paper from uh, 1989. But there is an extra assumption, which is full rank with NL uh, distinct eigenvalues. So under these assumptions, uh, we get the following three results. The first one is that any local minima is global. And that's the same results we used to have before. The second one is that other critical points are going to be subtle points. So the same sort of landscape as in the case of a single hidden layer neural network. The primary difference uh, is gonna be the following. Are those subtle points strict or not? So in the case of a single hidden layer, all subtle points were strict, but that's no longer the case here. So if you have this additional rank condition at your critical point, that the rank of the product of the matrices from the first to the L minus one layer is equal to the smallest size of the hidden layers, then uh, the subtle point is going to be strict. Otherwise, uh, the theorem is a little bit open-ended. Uh, I think it shows and it provides an example of cases where uh, the subtle points are not strict. Uh, but they could be strict, they could not be strict. But this is, I think, a concrete example showing that depth actually hurts optimization in that uh, now you would have to work harder to escape from some points that are not uh, strict. Okay, so <clears throat> with that part, let me conclude um, the optimization landscape for linear networks. Uh, so the main thing I've been showing is that all local minima are global uh, and that other critical points are generally subtle points, uh, that those subtle points are strict always in the case of networks with a single hidden layer, but non-strict subtles might exist uh, for deeper networks. 